Take your Bibles and go with me to the Gospel of Luke tonight. The Gospel of Luke. Can everybody hear me fine in the back? Some of you say I can hear you way too well. All right? Great. Luke chapter 16 tonight. You know, there is a movie out that uh, a lot of Christians are going to see, and some theologians are telling you you probably don't need to go see it. But there's a movie out, and it's called Heaven is for Real. How many of you be honest tonight and say, I've already gone and seen it? All right, put your hands down. I just want to say this to you. Don't base your theology of heaven after a movie. Make sure you go to the Word of God. And so we're going to kind of do that tonight. I want to talk to you tonight over the next few minutes on the subject, Is There Life After Death? And we've seen from the really success of the movie that there are so many people, whether they're Christians or whether they're non-Christians, that are so absolutely fascinated fascinated with the, the, the life after this life. And, uh, and so, I, you know, we want to deal with that a little bit tonight. We want to talk about that and ask the question, is there really life after death? And I think a, a great jump-off point is Luke 16, so go there with me. Let's look together, uh, just a few verses. Luke 16, 19. Here we read about the rich man and Lazarus. One represents someone who dies and goes to heaven. And the other represents someone who dies and goes to a place called hell. Look what he says in verse 19. Now there was a rich man, and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, joyously living in splendor every day. And the poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gates covered with sores and longing to be fed with the crumbs which were falling from the rich man's table. Besides, even the dogs were coming and licking his sores. Now the poor man, what? Died. Say it out loud. He what? Yeah. Folks, here's the reality. Unless Jesus Christ comes back and raptures you away, everybody in this room is going to die. Amen or oh me? We're going to die. The Bible says now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Now, that is a picture of paradise. And for us tonight, it's really a picture of this place called heaven that everybody in the room that has a relationship with God one day is going to go and spend the rest of their life in that place called heaven. Let's read on. The Bible says in the uh, last part of verse 22, and the rich man also, what? He did what? He died and was buried. And the Bible says in verse 23, and in Hell, or Hades, he lift up his eyes, being in torment. So here's the deal. Here's what happened. You've got one man who had a relationship with God. The Bible says he dies. And so what happens with him is he goes to this wonderful, glorious place called heaven. And then you've got the rich man who represents those who have never yet invited Christ into their life trusted Christ as Savior, and the Bible says that this man did not go to heaven, but this man went to hell. Now, folks, let me tell you something. You don't have any other choice. You either go to heaven or you go to hell. Well, I heard somebody say one time, preacher, that you kind of go somewhere in the middle, and it's a holding cell, and if you're good enough in that time period, then you can graduate up to heaven. I got a Greek word for that, friend, baloney. I mean, the Bible says that when you and I leave this earth, when we die, we either go to this place called heaven or we go to the other place called hell. And the Bible is very clear. He says that each and every one of us have an appointment with death. We're all going to die unless Jesus comes back again and receives us unto himself. We're all going to experience the death. We may die by design, that is, homicide or suicide. I've never in my life, ever in my life, seen so many suicides as I've seen as of late. Even within our young community, even as young as middle schoolers, we are seeing that suicide has become an epidemic. I go into high schools when I go and do meetings and I do a, an assembly program. It's called Let's Talk and we talk about the dangers of suicide and it never fails that when I get done, a little girl, a little boy 
teenager, high schooler will come up to me and they'll say, did you realize, did you know that just last week or last month that one of our football players or one of our cheerleaders or one of those that played in the band, they took their life. I'm hearing about it all over the place. We're going to die, number one, by design or by disaster. That's car crash, plane crash, hurricane, or around here, tornado. The Bible says we're going to die. Or by disease, cancer, I hate cancer. Heart disease, AIDS, the list goes on and on. And there's two really big, large misconceptions about death. One is, it goes like this. When you and I die, life just ends. And folks, listen, listen that's a lie. Hats out of hell by the devil himself. Because when you and I die, life doesn't just end, but rather life really just begins. There's another line that goes like this. When we die, we go into a peaceful sleep. Man, I've stood as, at the head of caskets on multiple occasions like your pastor has, Brother Nathan has, other pastors that may be here tonight. You've stood at the head of caskets and people walk by and they'll look in that casket at that old guy. Uh, we'll call him Joe. And everybody knows that old Joe was a, was, was a wicked man. Everybody knows that old Joe never gave his life to Jesus. Everybody knows that old Joe abused his wife. Everybody knows that old Joe, he was a sorry human being who never let the grace of God touch his life. And yet people will still walk by and they'll say, Oh, Joe, oh, Joe, he looks at peace. Folks, I want to tell you something. If old Joe never gave his life to Jesus Christ, he's the furthest thing from peace. And so there's all these misconceptions about death, but the reality is that each one of us have an appointment with death. And when we die, once again, get this down, when we die, we either go to this place called heaven or we go to the place called hell. Now let's just examine that tonight. What does the Bible, not what does a movie say, but what does the Bible say? Well, let's look first of all at the poor man his name was Lazarus. And the Bible says that Lazarus died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. In other words, he was carried to this beautiful, wonderful, glorious place called heaven. Now, where, how in the world can we know where he went? How, how can we see a description? Well, the best place to go is to Revelation chapter 21 and Revelation chapter 22. So go ahead and find your place there. Look there with me. Because it really doesn't matter what I think about heaven. It doesn't matter what you think about heaven. It doesn't matter what a book says about heaven. It doesn't matter what a movie says about heaven. But what really, really matters is what God's Word says about heaven. And Revelation 21 and Revelation 22 is a beautiful description of this place called heaven. As a matter of fact, John was exiled to the Isle of Patmos. Many people don't know this, but he was born in a cauldron of boiling oil. He miraculously survived, and then they exiled him to the Isle of Patmos. While, while he was on this island, God gave him a vision of what heaven, a description of what heaven's like. Now, as wonderful as this description is, it really cannot even compare to how wonderful heaven's going to be. But look, look what he says. As we walk down through this, just look at what he says. In chapter, tw uh, chapter uh, uh, 21, verses 12 and verse 17, he talks about there, there are going to be walls in heaven. Now, you know what that says to this old preacher? That tells me that heaven is going to be a safe place. I, I, I never will forget when I, I moved from Nashville. I was born in Nashville at the Baptist Hospital. When I was 10 years of age, we moved to a little small town in West Tennessee called Milan. Go Bulldogs. Thank you. Yeah, I got a couple of bulldogs here. And, and, and we moved to Milan. And I never will forget, we moved in this huge old house. And mom and dad wanted to fix her up, or they told us. But what the real deal was, that's all we could afford. I mean, when we walked in the house, there were buckets under every, in every room catching the rainwater. I mean, it was a dilapidated house on Liberty Street. And I found out later on down the road that it was the former parsonage of First Baptist Church in Milan. And we lived in that house, and I remember walking up on the front porch, and I saw the, the door handle of that house, and under the handle there was this strange-looking keyhole. Now, you know where I'm going with this, especially all of you that are over the age of 50. 
It was a weird looking keyhole. It was a what kind of key? That's right. It was a skeleton. And I remember when I was a kid, sometimes we'd lock the door at night, and most of the time we didn't lock the door at night. I remember those days. I mean, we lived in a safer world then than we do now. Now, if you go to bed now and don't lock your doors, friend, at the invitation time, come on up here, let us lay hands on you and pray for you. It's not a very safe thing to do in the world that we live in today. But what I'm, I believe that what he's saying here in this passage of Scripture, when he tells us that there are walls around heaven and walls in heaven, I think he's saying to you and I that heaven is going to be a very safe place. Why? Because the divine protector is going to be there. You know, we have some pretty strange-looking characters, Benji, don't we, coming into Soul Quest Church? Wouldn't you agree? You're, you, yeah, you're, you're the first strange one who came in. Uh, but we have, we have some pretty strange-looking uh, uh, folks that come in from time to time. And, and this past Sunday, one of my guys outside in the parking lot, we, we make a huge deal out of first impressions. That's huge for us. We want people to know that when they come to our church within the first five minutes, before they even get in our building, that they want to come back again. By the way, did you know that's a fact, Jack? That's a fact that people make a decision if they're going to come back to your church the first five minutes they're on your campus, not when they hear your preacher, not when they hear the music, but the first five minutes. That's why we've got to be hospitable and friendly. Amen. I mean, let your church be the most friendly place in Camden, Tennessee. But I, it's Sunday. There was a gentleman came in, and he had a big old, long 45 Magnum. My father-in-law was out in the parking lot. He about this tall. He can't hear. He can't see. But he saw the gun. And he got all jittery. He didn't know what was going to happen. Friend, I'm telling you, we just live in a world. That same guy came up to me after the service and showed me his arm, showed me a, a 357 Magnum hole all the way through his arm. He said, I got shot five times. This is the only one that hit me. It was point blank range. But my point is this. We live in a very dangerous world. Aren't you glad that God's going to be our divine protector in heaven? What else does he say? He said there are gates. Gates, chapter 21, verse 12. There's going to be a gate in heaven. Now, listen, I'll be honest with you. These other pastors that are here know a whole lot more about Bible. Uh, they're, they're scholars, they're theologians. I, I'm really not. I'm, an, I'm just an old dumb evangelist. I don't really know exactly how it's going to be. But just imagine, when we get to heaven, we're going to have to walk through a literal gate. Now, I know that there's a lot of symbolism in Revelation. I understand all that. And I don't know exactly how it's going to be. But can you imagine having to walk through a gate to get into that beautiful city, the New Jerusalem? Now, here's my point. Listen to this. Before you can ever get to that gate, you got to first of all go through the real gate. And the real gate is John 14, 6. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. The only way you're going to get to that gate is to go through the gate, and the gate is not Muhammad. The gate is not Buddha. The gate is not the baptistry. The gate is not your church membership, but the gate is Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the only way. You say, well, that's narrow-minded. I don't care. It's Bible. And so the Bible says what he says. He says, there is a wall in heaven there are gates in heaven. And then in chapter 21, verse 21, he says there's going to be a pearl in each gate. Now, if you know anything about pearls, now is it, are we anywhere near that freshwater pearl place? I remember when I was pastoring a church nearby in West Tennessee, maybe it was First Baptist Church in Trenton, we brought our senior adults for an outing. By the way, senior adult trips are just like youth trips, except they spend more money and, 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 you know, and amen, senior adults. We just have a great time. I remember going to that, that, that freshwater pearl thing, and, and he, he talked about the pearl. And we know that as we think about it and we examine pearls, pearls, comes at, pearls come as a result of a wounding or a cutting. Folks, I believe with all my heart that when we are in heaven, those of us that know Christ Jesus, and when we die, we're going to see the pearl in the gate. And every time, listen to me, every time we see the pearl in the gate, it's going to remind us of the wounding and the cutting that Jesus Christ went through for us. 
The only reason that we're there is because Jesus Christ took my hell and took your hell upon himself. He took our sin. They took a cat of nine tails and they beat Jesus until you could not even recognize him. They put him on a cross. They nailed his wrist to the cross because the bones in his hands were too fragile and weak to hold the weight of the body up. And, old, and here the Son of the living God could have called 10,000 angels to come and take him off the cross. But he didn't. Why? Because he loved you. And every time we see the pearl in the gate, it's going to remind us. It's going to remind us of what Jesus did for us. And then he talks about it in chapter 21, verse 16. He talks about the dimensions of heaven. He says that it's 1,500 miles high, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles deep. And let me remind you, folks, that's just the capital city, the New Jerusalem. You know what that says to this old preacher? It says to me that heaven is going to be a big place. It says to me that heaven's big enough for you. It's big enough for you. It's big enough for you. Yeah, you. It's big enough for you. It's big enough for some of you, some of you women that are here without your husband because they're lost and they won't give the... It's big enough for your husband. It's big enough for your mean neighbor. It's big enough for some of them cray crays in your family. Don't look at your left to your left or your right. Folks, I'm telling you, heaven's big, heaven's big enough for anybody who will say yes to Christ. It's a big place. And then he talks about in chapter 22, and verse 2 he says that there's going to be a tree of life. Now the tree of life was a very interesting tree. What does it say to us? Well, it's a tree that bears 12 different kinds of fruit 12 different months out of the year. How many of you got a fruit tree like that in your yard? How many of you would like to have one in your yard like that, right? Twelve kinds of fruit, twelve months out of the year. You know what that says to me? All that says to me, and it should say to you, is that every single need, every desire, everything that we want or we have to have, God said, I'm taking care of you because you are my child. It's good stuff. That's good stuff. No power shortage in heaven. Chapter 21, verse 23. No sin in heaven. Chapter 22 in verse 3. No sin Man, I'm telling you, all you got to do, all you got to do is turn the television on, Fox, CNN, whatever it may be. Man, I'm telling you, look, at, look on the web, surf the web. You're going to see bad news after bad news, sin after sin after sin after sin. Friend, I'm telling you, this world is messed up. It's messed up. For all of sin and come short of the glory of God. This world is messed up in heaven. There's no sin. Number two, there's no sorrow. Chapter 21, verse 4, there's no crying, there's no tears. Why? Because if we begin to try, try to cry, Jesus with his holy, loving, gracious, merciful finger is going to come and wipe every tear from our eyes. No crying. You know, some people love to cry. Some people can turn on the waterworks, amen? amen. Go ahead and do it down here. Because when you get to heaven, there'll be no more tears. No sorrow. No sin, no sickness. If anybody's sick in the house, you ought to get a little Baptocostal right here. Revelation 21, 4, no pain. How many of you would say, be honest tonight. Nobody's here but us. How many of you would say, somewhere in my body right now, somewhere in my body right now, I'm hurting. I mean, it may be a knee, it may be a back, it may be hands, it may be arthritis, it may be your ears from this preacher screaming at you, but somewhere in your body right now, you're hurting. Would you raise your hand? Lord Jesus. Nathan, we should have had Benny Hinn come in, brother. Somebody keeps calling me. Somebody answer this, will you? No, don't answer it. About a, year, about a year ago, I was diagnosed with what the doctors call psoriatic arthritis. Phil Mickelson, the golfer, if you've seen his commercials, you know what that is. You've seen that. It's just a worrisome, aggravating thing. I, sometimes I can't get, some mornings I cannot get out of the bed. I, I kind of had a, a little act up last night. I don't know if you could tell or not, but I just wasn't all, you know, just, and, and, and sometimes it's just hard to get out of bed and move. And you know what? When I get to heaven, <laughs> going to be gone, brothers and sisters, Amen. No more psoriatic arthritis. No more. No more of that. 
No more pain. No more cancer. No more heart disease. No more AIDS. No more. Why? Because God Almighty, listen, He is the great healer. He's the great physician. You see, the Bible says that heaven, man, this guy, he passed on. The poor man, Lazarus, passed on and he saw all these things that were happening. He said, man, there's also, there's angels in heaven. I don't know about you, but that's going to be pretty cool, isn't it? See an angel. I, I don't think they're going to look like the ones that we see in these little shops, you know, these little girls, pretty porcelain faces and little wings. As a matter of fact, I think, Nathan, in the Bible, the word angel is most time masculine, correct? Sorry, ladies, but the angels are men. And they probably don't wear makeup. Amen? Yes, amen. Thank you, sister. Get a little amen and in the house. We're going to see angels. You know what's so cool about angels? Here's what's so cool about angels. You know what angels do 24 hours a day, seven days a week? There's one thing that they do. You want to know what it is? Here it is. All angels do 24-7 is they raise their hands to a holy God and they say, Worthy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and who is to come. I mean, that's all angels do. They praise and they worship Jesus Christ because He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy. He's worthy of our praise. Now listen to me. If you're Baptist and you've been raised Baptist all your life like I have, I want you to hear what I'm saying. Quit letting all these other denominations outdo us. Who said that Baptists had to be dead? Man, I had people come to our church and they say, Y'all aren't Baptist, y'all aren't really Baptist, are you? Like Baptists can't say amen. Like Baptists can't shout. Like Baptists can't have a, a, a Baptist coastal jig, amen. Man, I took off running one Sunday. I'm telling you, friend, listen, when you get excited about the Lord Jesus Christ, you put all the dignity and the rigor mortis behind you and you worship King Jesus. Friend, listen to me. Why in the world, why in the world are we going to allow angels to outdo us? You see, angels have never, ever, ever experienced the grace of God. But you have, and you have. It's time for us to get a little shout in our praise. Amen? Amen. The Bible says there's going to be angels in heaven. And then he says, I think that, uh, you, you know, this guy, he saw old acquaintances. Some people are in this room, I'm not calling you old, but you've lived long enough that you've got more on the other side than you got left here. My grandmother just turned 96 years of age. She lives in Nashville. She is still a seamstress. She's got four customers that she still does alterations for. 96 years old. She reads through the Bible every year. She calls me usually around Halloween time, and she says, I finished early, Ronnie. She didn't have much, she didn't have or any friends left. They're already gone on before. But I remember when I was just a little, by the way, there is power in the tongue, isn't there? My granny's been telling me since I was a little kid, I'm going to be 105. I will not die until I'm 105. She's 96. I said, Granny, you got nine years left. Some people, some people are going to, you're going to see old acquaintances, new acquaintances. You'll see some great men and women of God that you've always maybe read about. And then loved ones. Everybody wants to hear this one, don't they? Husband, wife, mom, dad, maybe a child. They didn't make it. The question I'm asked, will we recognize each other in heaven? Will I know them in heaven? Now, folks, I'll tell you, I, I don't, I'm not a scholar. I'm not a scribe. I'm not a theologian. But I do think that we'll recognize each other in heaven for two reasons. Number one, because we're going to have a whole lot more sense there than we got now. <laughs> Number two, because of the mountain of transfiguration. Remember that? There was Jesus, there was Moses, and there was Elijah in their glorified bodies. Now look at me, look at me. There was Moses and Elijah in the glorified. I don't know exactly what that looked like, but I can imagine it was some trans. It was, it was maybe, you know, kind of Casper looking, you know, kind of ghosty looking. And there the disciples were, and there they stood, and, and the disciples did not have to turn to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, 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 who are those ghostly looking guys? No, they said, hey, hey, there's Moses and there's Elijah. They recognized them. 
Hmm. All I'm saying is this. Is there life after death? Absolutely. And if you know Jesus Christ, guess what? You're going to spend an eternity in this wonderful, glorious place called heaven. But you know what? All that stuff's good. But the greatest thing, chapter 22 and verse 4, is we shall see His face. <laughs> I'm telling you, the walls of Jasper, man, they're going to be beautiful. They're going to be cool. The gates of pearl, I mean, the tree of life, all that stuff, man, I'd like to go just for that. But you know what makes heaven heaven? What makes heaven heaven is the presence, follow me, the presence of Jesus Christ. Can I go a little bit longer tonight? Can I go a little bit longer? Teachers, will you? Is that okay? I promise it won't be too much longer. But I want you to do this with me. Put your arm out. Sanctified imagination. Put your hat on. All right, here we go. Can you imagine walking into heaven? I don't know exactly what it's going to be like, but could you imagine walking into heaven and there when you walk through those pearly gates on your right and your left, there is that Baptist welcoming committee. First impressions. That Baptist, and they've got the best thing that anybody could ever offer you, white chocolate macadamia nut cookies. Amen? Amen? And they've been taken out of the oven when they still look like they're not done, but they cook about another minute on the stove, and they're so gooey. Can I get an amen? amen. Woo! You walk in, and there you see the Baptist, the committee, and they're handing you cookies, and you walk in, and you see Moses, and you see Elijah, you see Abraham, you see Paul and Peter. And you turn to Abraham. Oh, Abe. Oh, Abraham, brother, he... He shakes your hand. He hugs your neck. Welcome, welcome to glory land. Welcome to Beulah land. Welcome to heaven. And you say, oh, Abraham, brother, I want to spend about a million years with you, and I want to talk to you about that day when God told you to take your son Isaac and sacrifice him on the altar, but then God supplied the ram. Oh, Abraham, man, I want to talk to you about that, but hold your thought. I got somebody else I got to go see. And there he is, Moses. Wow. Hey, Moses, brother. Man, I want to spend about five million years with you because, Moses, you were a man that did not have the prerequisites maybe for success. You couldn't speak very well. You came up with every excuse in the world why you couldn't do what God told you to do. And, Moses, you, you obeyed God, and God took you and shaped you and molded you, and you helped deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. Moses, man, I want to spend a lot of time with you, but, Moses, hold your thought. I got somebody else I just got to go see. And there he is, Elijah. A man that knew the power of God. Oh, Elijah, man, I want to talk to you about how the power of God fell. But Elijah, hold your thought. I got somebody else I got to go see. You turn to your left, and there he is, Peter. I mean, this guy was so much like a lot of us. Open mouth, insert foot, hello. <laughs> Remember when they came to get Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Peter took his dagger out and cut off the dude's ear. Soldier's ear. Was it a soldier? One of them. One of the bad guys. Cut his ear off. Jesus picked up the ear and put it back on, healed him, right? Peter was so much like so many of us speak and think later. But he also denied Jesus, didn't he? I don't know who you're talking about. He spent all this time, but I don't even know who you're talking about. Leave me alone. But yeah, you're Peter. You're one of the guys that walked and talked with Jesus. You're one of the 12. Man, you're one of the, in, you're, you're in the in, inner circle. Yeah, you're Peter. You're Peter. Listen, I don't even know who you're talking about. Bleep, 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 bleep. Leave me alone. I don't even know who you're talking about. He denied Jesus. The cock crow, right? But oh, I love Mark 16. I think it's verse 7. Go tell my disciples and Peter. <laughs> Peter, man, I, I want to talk to you, brother. He's on this side. Peter, I want to talk to you, brother, for 10 million years. ADD moment. I want to talk to you, brother, and talk to you about the forgiveness and the love of God. And how God took a, a, a nobody and forgave him. And God's grace poured upon you. And God forgave you. And God gave you a second chance and a third chance and a fourth chance and a fifth chance. And then God used you to preach the message at Pentecost. Wow! Don't ever buy into the lie, friend, because you failed God in your past that you can't be used of God in your future. Amen. But Peter, dude, hold your thought. You look like Peter. That's why I said, Peter, hold your thought. I got somebody else I got to go see. 
Folks, look at me. Look at me. I got somebody. And then you get to the Apostle Paul. Wow. All the preachers want to talk to Paul. Paul, what did you really mean when you said that in your epistle? Who was right? Were the assemblies of God right? Or were the Baptists right? Were the Methodists right? Or the Presbyterians right? Tell me about the sovereignty of God. Paul, man, I'd love to talk to you for 20 million years about that day on the road to Damascus. <laughs> Paul, I wish I could have been there. I wish I could have been a fly on the donkey's ear. I'd have loved to have been there. Paul, please tell me about that day when the power of God fell, knocked you off your ride. Friend, I'm telling you, God wants to knock you off your ride tonight. I want to talk to you about that, but Paul, hold your thought, I got somebody else to see. And then you turn to your right. Oh, my friend. <laughs> there he is. You see, when I go to heaven, I don't want to spend the first trillion years with anybody other than Jesus. Because you see, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Because Paul didn't die on the cross for my sins. Peter didn't die on the cross for my sins. As great a man of God, Moses didn't die on the cross for my sins. Abraham didn't die on the cross for my sins. Isaac didn't die on, Elijah didn't die on the cross for my sins. But I'm telling you who did. It's the one who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. His name is Jesus Christ. He died for my sins. Oh, one day, one day, because I have a relationship with God Almighty, oh, I'm going to bow before a holy God. I'm going to fall on my face before Jesus, and I'm going to spend the first tree in years, five tree in a hundred tree years, praising the one who died for me. Why? Because he loved me. His grace came down upon me. He rescued me. He turned a nobody into somebody. Oh, friend, I'm telling you, if you love God, and God loves you, and you've accepted him, you ought to give him a great big praise offering tonight. You see, the Bible says that the poor man Lazarus died. Yeah, and he experienced heaven, but the rich man, wow. The Bible says he didn't go to heaven, but the Bible says he went to hell. And when he went to hell, there were some things that he found out. What are they? Just quickly, quickly. He discovered that there was mental torment in hell. Where, where do you get that? The Bible says in chapter uh, 16, he says the key word, remember, 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 remember. He had a mind in hell. He had a mind in hell. And if you choose, listen to me, if you choose, to reject Jesus Christ tonight. And you don't ever give your life to Jesus. And you die one day and you go to the place called hell. You're going to remember every opportunity you ever had to get saved. You're going to remember your pastor preaching to you, pleading with you every week to trust Jesus. You're going to remember this this evangelist that was here this week begging you and pleading with you to turn your back on your sin, repent of your sin, and turn your life to God. Your, can you imagine that? Almost like a video screen. Could you imagine that? Almost like a video screen playing over and over and over. Could you imagine seeing and hearing those childhood uh, songs that we used to sing in vacation Bible school and Sunday school? Could you imagine over and Could you imagine seeing John 3, 16? Oh my goodness, over and over. For God so loved the world. Oh, I could have accepted his love, but I chose not to. I said no. Could you imagine seeing John 3, 16 over and over and over? I'm telling you, we're going to have a mind in hell. And then also, not only was there mental torment, but there was physical torment. He says, in, that there, he said, being in torments. Verse 23. Being in torments. The Bible says it's going to be a little literal flame. Remember the um, story of Moses went up, went up on the mountain, he saw the burning bush, it burned and it burned and it finally went out, right? No, it burned and it would not be consumed, right? The Bible says that hell is like that. You know, hell wouldn't be so bad, I guess, if you could just burn up within a minute or two or a day or even a month or a year. But it's not the way it's going to be. It's a, it's a flame... It, it's a burning that will not be quenched. The fire that will not be quenched. Torments. 
torments in hell. Voltaire was a philosopher of yesteryear. He would come into a town, he'd get on a soapbox, and he would gather a crowd around, and he, would, he didn't believe in God. He, he spent all his time trying to disprove God. I never understood why people that don't believe in God, why they spend wasting their time, but he tried to disprove God. He would draw a crowd around. He'd say, folks, gather up. I'm going to prove to you that there is no God. He said, I'm going to give God 60 seconds to, to kill me. And then he began to scream into the, into the clouds, God, hey, God, if you're up there, God, God, if you're up there, God, I want you to prove that you are who you say you are by killing me. Strike me dead, God. I've given you 60 seconds. Kill me, God. Prove that you're God. 59, 58, 57, 56, 55, 54, 53, 52, 51, 50. God, where are you? God, these people are waiting. By that time, a crowd had gotten huge. Hey, God, God, these people are waiting. Prove that you are who you say you are. 30, 29, 28, 27, 26, 25. God, where are you, God? 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Voltaire would take that bony finger. He pointed into the crowd, and he would say, you stupid people, there is no God. True story. Voltaire was on his deathbed. The doctor came in and said, Voltaire, we can't give you six more weeks to live. Voltaire didn't make it, I think, six days. And he went out into eternity screaming. This is a documented fact. He went out, went out into eternity screaming, God, I can feel, I can feel the flames of hell on my feet. It's awful to die and go to hell. And we could spend all of our life trying to disprove God and still, God and still die and go to hell. You see, this man died, went to hell, and he found out there was mental torment there. He discovered there was physical torment there. He discovered, listen to this, he discovered he had said no to a loving God. Loving God. Aren't you glad our God is a God who loves us and did not create hell for you or anybody else? He created hell for the devil and his angels. And he's done everything that he can possible. He's given his own son to die for you. How many of you have a, if you have a son, would you raise your hand? If you have a son. Now, how many of you, don't raise your hand because surely you would, how many of you would, would, would give your son to die for the human race? I can't wait until a week from this Thursday. My family and I, we're packing up, and we're going to drive to Lynchburg, Virginia. My son is 22 years of age. He's graduating from Liberty University with a bachelor's degree in religion or Christian studies. Not only did he get his college degree in four years, but he got his college degree and his master's in four years in one month. He's a smart dude. I don't know where he came from, not me. He is a theologian. He is a scholar. He, he's, he, he, he's very intelligent. He's going to end up getting married, marrying a girl from Maryland, and a Christian, godly young lady, and they're going to get married in October. And come, he's going to come back, and he's going to be on staff and help me at SoulQuest Church, and I'm really excited. about. He's going to help me with the organized chaos that we have right now. I love my boy. If you were to come to me and you were to say, hey, Ronnie, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll get saved. If, here's the condition, if you'll let me have your son. Take your son out in the backyard and do whatever I want to to your son. Slap him around, spit in his face, strip him naked, humiliate him. Take a whip and beat him until he's not recognizable. Hey, Ronnie, give me your son Austin and, and, and let me take him and, and, and beat him and ultimately, ultimately, ultimately take him and, and nail him to an oak tree, a big oak tree in the backyard. If you'll give me your son and let me take him and torture him and kill him, then, then I'll get saved. You know what I would say to you? You'd have to die and go to hell because you can't have my son. I don't love you that much. I love you, but I don't love you that much. But I know somebody who does. God the Father loved you so much that he was 
Think about it that way. He loved you so much that he was willing to give his own son, his only, the Bible says, his only begotten son to die on a cruel cross. Listen, not only did he die, but he took the weight of the sin of the whole human race, past, present, and future sin upon himself. He did that for you. Why? Because he absolutely, absolutely adores you. I don't know if you've been told that in a while, but I'm telling you, listen to me. I don't care where you've been or what you've done. God absolutely loves you unconditionally. You see, when this man died without Jesus, he went to hell and he discovered that he had said no to this loving God. And then he also discovered that he had said no and that he'd waited one day too late. One day too late. You know, now I'm sure he wants to get saved, doesn't he? Well, I, 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 here's the deal. I know what I'll do. If I don't make it to heaven and I go to hell, then I know eventually God will let me out. I'll do good. I'll get early parole. I'll get transferred. I'll go to heaven. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. He had said no. He waited one day too late. I said earlier that heaven, I'm closing. I said earlier that heaven is heaven. Why? Not because of the wall of Jasper and the gates of pearl and the tree of life and all that. Heaven's heaven because Jesus is there. But let me tell you something. You know why hell is hell? Not because the worm dies not. Hell is not hell because the fire is not quenched. Hell is not hell because of outer darkness. You know why hell is hell? All that's true. But hell is hell because Jesus is not there. Separation from God. I want you to ask you to listen to me very carefully. This message is over in three minutes, but listen closely. So many people, I'm, I, I believe this with all my heart. There's two things that send people to hell more than anything else. One is religion. Yeah, I'm religious. Religion will do nothing but sin. Religion is just your attempts to get to God. Another thing is procrastination. Procrastination will never get you to your destination. Tweet it. <laughs> Procrastination will never get you to your destination. And I, I believe with all my heart that so many people have good intentions. They, yeah, you know, I need to get saved. But I'll do it later. I close with this. Can you imagine? Once again, put your hand out. Come on, once again, put your hand out. Put your sanctified imagination out on can you imagine a convention in hell? We're, we're almost done. I want you to listen to this. Can you imagine a convention in hell? And Satan stands up in front of all of his demons. Remember the demons? They used to be angels and one third of them fell because Satan sinned. So you got all these demons, a congregation of demons in a convention hall. And Satan stands up there and Satan says something like this. He says, demons... I want you to help me discover the best way to down more souls to hell than anything else. All of a sudden, with speakers or microphones set up like you do at the, I'm visualizing, this is a terrible, I shouldn't say this, I'm visualizing Southern Baptist Convention with, it's the only convention I remember, with microphones set up everywhere, and then the pastors come, that was terrible, man. That was terrible. Don't, don't dock my love offering. But all this, there's microphones everywhere. And then the demons, one demon would come up and he said, Satan, Satan, I know how we can down more people to hell. Let's tell the world that there is no God. Satan said, hmm, that's pretty good, but it'll never work because anybody with any sense can go out and look at the splendor and the glory of the creation. And no, there must have been a creator. It takes more faith to believe in some kind of big bang than it does that God created. Won't ever work. Never work. And then all of a sudden, there's another sinister demon that came to the microphone. And he said, I know, I know, Satan. I know how we can damn more souls to hell. Let's tell the world that Jesus did not rise from the dead. He did die. He was a prophet. He was a good man. But he didn't rise from the dead. Satan said, that's good, but it'll never work. It'll never work. Because, you see, there were too many eyewitnesses. It would hold up in the court of law. Hmm. And then there was this clever little demon. He walks up to the mic. 
And he said, Satan, I've got it. Let's tell the world that God is who God says that He is. Let's tell the world that Jesus Christ did die, that He was buried, and that He did rise from the dead. Let's even tell this world that they need to be saved. Brother, will you come up and just begin to play something for me softly or whoever? Come on up. Let's tell the world that Jesus did die and that he rose again. Let's tell the world there, that there is a God. Let's tell people they need to be saved. Watch this. Here it is. Watch me. Look at me. But let's tell the world, follow me, that they can do it later. And all of a sudden, the whole convention hall broke out in applause. Why? My friend, the devil is sending more people to hell because so many people are saying, yeah, you know that's right. I need to be saved. I need Christ in my life. But I'll do it later. It may be pride that keeps you from coming to Christ. Some of you, I've never seen anything. Men are the world's worst. I love preaching men's conferences and seeing men come to Christ. But I'm telling you, men are the world's worst. We're full of pride. We, wanna, we want everybody to think we got it all figured out. Let me tell you something. Sir, let me tell you something. You don't have it all figured out. You can't fix it. But God can help fix it through you. Don't let pride keep you. Don't let procrastination keep you from coming to Jesus. The Bible is very clear. There is life after death. There is. There is life after death. It's called eternity. And eternity is too long to be wrong. You're either going to go to a place called heaven or you're going to go to a place called hell. And it's the Spirit of God is speaking to your heart tonight. Don't you dare leave this place without accepting the love and the grace and the pardon that God Almighty is offering you tonight. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes.